Hello, welcome along. It's time for a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thank you so much for listening. I am your guide as we tour around to search for all the truly remarkable secrets lurking in the universe. This week, uh, we're looking at one of the best hunters out in the wild. You can also hear about a star that's been sent hurtling across the universe, and I've got some of your questions to answer. Today, they're on lava lamps, on waking up, and about water as well. We'll cover those in just a sec. First, let's get into it with one of our favourite geniuses on the show. This is Professor Hallock. Professor Hallock's Digital Dental Depository, with support from Philips Sonicare. To honour great Uncle Halitosis, dentist extraordinaire, on the occasion of his 100th birthday, Professor Halux is creating a pop-up digital dental depository, an oral health help desk. He's going to see how many questions all about teeth he can answer against the clock. I think the turbine's nearly up to speed. Fun facts about fluoride today, Nurse Nanobot. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's crack on with the first question. What is fluoride? Fluoride is a chemical compound, an inorganic, monatomic anion of the element fluorine. Sorry, Prof. You'll have to make it a bit simpler than that. OK, fluoride is a natural mineral, which is really good for your teeth. It's naturally found in many foods and in the water we get from our taps. Hmm. Is fluoride added to our tap water? Well, fluoride has been proven to have massive benefits to dental health and to significantly reduce tooth decay. But as the natural level of fluoride in our water varies across the country, it's added in some areas. Impressive! So, how does fluoride help to keep the teeth healthy? Fluoride strengthens the tooth enamel, making it more resistant to tooth decay. It also reduces the amount of acid that the bacteria on your teeth produce. So, how come you can't taste it in the water? The amount of fluoride in water is very small. If your water does have a taste, it's more likely to be from natural minerals. Things like calcium, magnesium, potassium, or a number of other minerals depending on its source. Right, time for a true or false. All toothpastes contain fluoride. That's true. Ah, OK, it's false. There are a wide variety of toothpastes available, but not all contain fluoride. That's why you should check that yours does, in an appropriate amount for your age. We're racing towards the finish. Another true or false? You should always rinse your mouth after cleaning your teeth. False. Here's what you should be doing. Get a good fluoride toothpaste. Use a pea-sized portion to thoroughly brush your teeth. An electric toothbrush can be especially effective. But don't rinse your mouth. You'll only be rinsing away the fluoride, so it won't be able to do its job keeping your gnashes in top nick. And don't swallow your toothpaste. While it's not harmful, too much of a good thing is not great. And your stomach doesn't need a good clean. That's correct. And time's up. Brilliant, Professor. Very respectable score there, and lots of data for our digital dental depository. Professor Halix's digital dental depository, with support from Philip Sonicare. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Halix. Right, let's get some of your questions answered then. These are the ones that you have sent in as a review uh, for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. If you've got something sciencey wriggling around your brain, head there, find this show. You can leave us a review. There's a comment box at the bottom. That is where you leave your question. That is what Leighton has done. Leighton asks, how do lava lamps work? Well, the, the, in a lava lamp, you have two liquids, Leighton, that are similar weights and they can't be mixed together. It's really important. You can't combine them, blend them up. Now, in lava lamps, there are usually th- these two liquids are a type of wax and oil or maybe water. Uh, and then what you do is you heat it up at the bottom. Usually this is from a light bulb. That tiny light bulb makes quite a lot of heat. Now, the heavier liquid then absorbs this heat, which makes it get bigger. And as it gets bigger, it expands but strangely, as it expands, it becomes less dense and then lighter. And as it becomes lighter, it floats down to the bottom because it cools down. It sinks. And then the other liquid then goes up. 
and then it comes back down again. So there's this huge swirling motion of liquid getting hotter, rising, cooling down, sinking, rising, sinking. There you go, Leighton. That's that one done. Thank you so much. Uh, this is from someone who has not left their name. Please do leave a name if you are going to drop us a review over on Apple Podcasts so I can then say hello. But it's a brilliant question, so I thought we'd have to cover it. Uh, they ask, how do you wake up? A tough one, right? It's an amazing question, and it's really hard to get a proper answer to this one. Uh, now, we don't mean how do you wake up with loud noises if there's a thunderclap outside your window. That's why you've sp- suddenly been shocked awake. But why do you naturally wake up? It's all a bit unknown. Experts think that it has something to do with your biological clock. It's the clock inside you that makes cells grow and die, and it follows the time of the day without you having to look at a watch. That's why you get sleepy at times. Well, that's actually because of a protein called PER. That's what controls the pattern of being asleep and waking up. When the levels of PER are low at night, you'll become groggy and then sleepy. And when you wake up in the morning, your PER levels rise and they release hormones which start getting your body in gear to ease you into the day. Your sleep becomes lighter and lighter um, uh, until you wake up. Uh, It's kind of a hard thing to explain. I've given it a go. I hope I've done an all right job. Basically, it's a protein telling you that it's almost time to wake up. It knows when to do that because you've learned about it uh, through your biological clock and then your body gets ready for it. Right, I think we should move on. I've done a good go at that. Lastly, this is from Cozy Urchin today, who asks, Why is swimming pool water blue, but regular water is clear? Another fantastic question. This is all because of the way water and light interact with each other. When you've got a small amount of water, like in a glass, it's colourless and it's clear, isn't it? Because it's not enough to do the job that it needs to do to make it blue. When you've got a massive amount of water, like in a pool, uh, the water molecules that are in there, they naturally absorb quite a lot of the light from the spectrum of colours that light rays have in them. You know this, don't you? That that all rays of light have pretty much every single colour in them. When those rays hit a large amount of water, the water naturally absorbs quite a lot of the red colours and they leave and reflect back uh, the blue and the green colours, which is why swimming pools look blue. There you go. Answers to your questions done for this week. If you want something answered on next week's show, you need to leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, if you're still kind of stuck at home making the most of your back garden, uh, here is a way that you can put that to good use. You can take part in the big butterfly count. To tell us more, we've got Dr. Zoe Randall from the Butterfly Conservation on the line. Hey, Zoe. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Let's get straight into it then. What what would you like people to do? How can we help out with the big butterfly count? We would love people to spend 15 minutes in their gardens or in their local park or churchyard or out on a countryside walk and spend just spend 15 minutes counting the butterflies that they see um, and they on a nice warm sunny day and what they can do is log their sightings on the um, big butterfly count website which is bigbutterflycount.org or you can download the free smartphone app and uh, log your sightings on there. When would you like us to take part in this? Well, the count officially starts Friday the 17th of July and it runs until the 9th of August. So we've got a few weeks by the time that people will hear this. Brilliant. Now, uh, I've got some stats in front of me here, uh, which you got from last year's butterfly count. Uh, Mm -hmm. Last year, it says uh, 1,595,579 butterflies were counted, which is an average of 16 and a quarter butterfly um, per 15 minutes of someone looking. And that strikes me as as quite a lot. I live in in a flat in in South London. If if I go out into the park, I'm probably not going to see a lot of butterflies. Whereabouts in the country, in in the UK, are are we likely to see loads of butterflies that boost those numbers? Well, all of the butterflies and the two day flying moths that are in our big butterfly count there, you will be able to see the majority of them virtually anywhere in the UK. Um, so but the best place to go really would be where there's a nice buddleia bush or you've got lots of nectar plants in a garden or something like that. What else were the results last year then, Zoe? What can we expect? So uh, can you just give us a little breakdown of the um, of all the different types of butterflies that people saw? 
So last year, the um, the utter winner of the big butterfly count was the painted lady butterfly. Now, that's a migratory species that comes over from Africa and uh, flies from Africa and then to Europe and, and breeds. And then it comes to the UK. And last year we had... And there were 420,841 of those counted last year. So, um, so last year was a real good painted lady year. Um, these events don't happen uh, very regularly. They're normally about sort of every every 10 years. So we and I've not seen very many, if any, painted ladies myself yet this year. So I think we can count cross painted lady off the year, off the list for this year. Um, but the um, marbled white butterfly that did fantastically well last year in the big butterfly count and um, and it's had a really really good spring uh, we had a warm spring this year so um, it's come out much earlier than normal and so and it's been seen in really really good high numbers so we're just hoping that that butterfly is still flying around during the big butterfly count and that's one we really want people to keep an eye out for because it could be that because it came out so early it's it's sort of petering out and finishing early what are the reasons for these huge changes in numbers? Again, I'm looking at the stats in front of me. You were just talking about the painted lady. Um, the, the, the percentage change in how many painted that ladies there were last year and two years ago was almost two and a half thousand. Why were there so many of them around last year? Um, well, they're migratory butterfly. Some some years they do just have these like really really good years, um, um, mainly because the weather conditions where they are are fantastic. So they can get to high, they can breed really well, and there's high numbers. And obviously, if you're a, a very mobile species like the painted lady, um, in order to have the best chance of future survival, you need to sort of spread out and migrate and move to places where there, there are more resources. So there's high numbers where you're born, say, um, but because there's so many other butterflies there, resources are going to become limited if everybody stays in the same place and everybody wants to eat the same food and mate, you know, mate with the same mates and such like. So in, or so in order to survive into the future, they need to spread out and uh, in increase their their increase the opportunities for resources and mates and such like two problems with counting butterflies i want you to clear up for us does it matter if i may be spotting the same butterfly twice in my 15 minutes that's number one number two uh, there are all these different uh, types of butterfly that we're looking out for how am i meant to know the difference between a red admiral and a, and a comma or a, or a six spot burner and a holly blue well We've got um, an ID chart that you can download from the Big Butterfly Count website, and that shows a, a lovely little pictures of all the different butterflies, um, both the upper wings and the un and, and the underside of the wings as well. So that's kind of that nails that that particular issue, and um, and when it comes to um, counting the counting the butterflies in your big butterfly count and double counting there are some rules there are some rules and instructions on the big butterfly count website as to how you uh, how you avoid double counting amazing so just get online look up the big butterfly count you will find it you'll get the rules now obviously over the last few months what are you expecting uh, the, the lockdown to have done to the butterfly behavior at this point in time, it's too early really to say what's happened, um, what will be happening. Um, but one, one, one thing that may have a, a positive, a, a positive effect is the fact that there hasn't been as many cars on the road. And there haven't been as many, there weren't any, aer as many aeroplanes flying and things like that. So, so, um, so air pollution and in terms of uh, things like nitrogen, that can affect that the, the nitrogen deposition from all these fumes and such like can affect the food plants of the butterflies and and um, and so the specialist food plants are out competed by nitrogen loving plants so that can affect the you know the amount of uh, food plant that's there available for for specialist species now whether this sort of short pause in 
pumping all these nasty pollutants into our atmosphere is going to have had an effect or not um it's it's far too early to say um but i mean i i i mean myself i've noticed that lots of lots of things uh lots of creatures have have got a lot braver there's been blackbirds fighting in my garden right in front of me and uh things do seem to have become a little less shy um while we've been cooped up in our houses now you're someone that knows their butterflies uh, what type of butterfly would it be amazing to see? Uh, to, to you know that it, it is flying around the UK. I mean, when you get all the results back in in a few months' time, and when you're churning through them all, what type of butterfly would you be utterly gobsmacked if you saw it? If someone had seen it around the country, it's because because you'd have to go to specialist habitats to see them really and uh, yeah because they're, they're they're habitat specialists so they a lot of them depend on on a particular uh host plant where they lay their eggs and such like and a lot of the specialists are out earlier in the year as well so um so they, they're not f- not flying at this particular time of year the reason why we do the big butterfly count sort of late mi- mid july to uh, early august is because normally this is the peak flight season for the adult butterflies and the majority majority of species are flying now whereas like I said the specialists are normally a little bit earlier. Um, one, one butterfly that we're really keen to keep an eye on and keep a lookout for this year would be the small tortoise shell because the early spring weather has um, boosted numbers um, so they've had a really good first generation and if you normally what happens if a species has a really good first generation the second generation is a bumper generation as well so if we get bumper numbers of small tortoise shells this year which is is a possibility that would be absolutely fantastic because that particular species has declined by 79 percent since the late 1970s so um so to see that species bounce back this year would be absolutely incredible now, away, away from the actual counting, because we don't really want to skew the numbers that much, what can we do in our back gardens to encourage more butterflies to, to, to fly over and to, to take up space in our habitat? Is there anything that, that we can do uh, just, just to boost the numbers? Absolutely. I mean, our gardens are little oases for uh, oases for uh, for butterflies, particularly in urban areas. And um, the thing you can do really is um, in your garden, you can do butterfly and moth friendly garden gardening. So this can range from growing um simply growing nectar plants so you've got like a fast food stop if you like in your garden so things like buddleia verbena lavender perennial wallflower um, michaelmas daisies red valerian french marigolds all those things if you grow those in your garden um, then you've you're providing food for the butterflies and so when they're passing by they'll see that and think oh i'm fancy fancy a nibble so they'll fly on in and, uh, and, and and drink some nectar from those plants um, you can also leave a wild area in your garden so um, just don't don't cut all the grass everywhere leave some wild bits around the edges or i mean my my gra- my my lawn i just cut a path up through the middle uh, and it's long either side and again have some you know nice nectar plants in there and 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 caterpillar food plants and the one thing that really does um is totally unbeneficial for man or beast is astroturf and there has been a huge move towards people putting you know getting rid of their lawns and putting astroturf down and uh, basically that's completely sterile and, and and as i said no good for man or beast so get rid of the uh, get rid of the astroturf get proper grass well listen i've just been on the website so if you if you get on google whatever and type in big butterfly count the first thing that comes up is the butterfly conservation's fantastic website it's so easy to get involved you can download an app uh, you can even print out the the butterfly id chart there's three stages it takes just 15 minutes of your time before the 9th of August so you've got a few weeks to crack on with it uh, and get counting butterflies Uh, Dr Zoe Randall thank you so much for coming on the show you're very welcome thanks for having me for this week's Dangerous Dan we're looking at one of the best hunters in the wild the serval is a fierce cat from Africa. It is ruthless. It's got a small head with huge ears, golden orange and black fur and an extremely long springy legs 
they're hunters all the time as well. They never stop looking for food at day, at night, and they sneak up on all sorts of prey. Rats, birds, reptiles, they'll pretty much eat anything that they can find, and they know they're there. They can pick them out with their brilliant sense of hearing. And when it finds the prey, they'll slowly stalk it, biding its time. Then, at the special moment, it will leap out quickly, pouncing with feet stretched forward, knocking the prey down, and immediately sinking its teeth deep into the prey's flesh. They've got about a 50% kill rate in hunting, which means they're successful with catching prey every other time they try, uh, which is an extremely high rate. They're exceptional hunters. The serval are terrifying, skilled, stealthy beasts. It's time to catch up with one of our favourite inventors and engineers at Fun Kids HQ. This is Sir Sidney McSprocket, uh, and in his brand new series, he's having a look at all the British inventors that have made huge waves uh, and changed the world. Sir Sidney McSprocket's Great British Minds. Oh, hello, Sir Sidney McSprocket here. Now, I consider myself quite the innovator. Some of my creations have been the talk of the town, like my porter shoppy. A lovely shop on wheels, easy to move to wherever your customers may be. Others, like my revolving trifle dispenser, well, less impressive. But our country has always been proud of its inventors, women and men with fine minds solving problems and helping us to improve our lives through invention, design and innovation. This was never more the case than in 1851, Victorian Britain. Ah, it was an exciting time for sure. Industry had never been busier, and improvements in transport and communication meant the world was being connected in a tremendous number of new ways. And in 1851, a grand, nay, a great exhibition was held in London to celebrate the work of great minds from every country on Earth. It was the brainwave of Prince Albert, husband to the venerable Queen Victoria. The Prince and his Royal Commission resolved to celebrate the global advances of the Industrial Age as led by Britain, oh, and the wider world too, bringing like-minded folk together and sharing what we know is a terrific way to generate new ideas and to inspire other people. What? began to build a venue. In just five months, the glittering Crystal Palace was complete. An enormous structure of iron and glass, which must have looked absolutely magnificent twinkling in the sunshine. Three times the height of St. Paul's Cathedral, and as long as 51 London buses, it was the largest building in the world at that time. But the palace wasn't there to look impressive. When it opened its doors in May 1851, it contained 100,000 exhibits from 13,937 exhibitors from every corner of the globe. Machines which could fold thousands of envelopes and a printing press turning out newspapers in a jiffy. New types of guns and locks and a perfume fountain, no less, for the visitors to dip their handkerchiefs. Another very popular attraction was the Koh-i-Noor Diamond. Oh, it was a fair mountain of light. And the largest diamond known in the world at that time. What a sight! (gasps) 40,000 visitors would marvel at the exhibits and demonstrations each day, and over a third of the population of the country would visit the exhibition, eager to see what the future might be like. Victorians were just like us, you see. Many of you might have visited the Science Museum in London, or perhaps been to a concert at the Royal Albert Hall. There in a part of London known as Albertopolis. And here's the thing, it's named after Prince Albert, 
and the land for these inspiring institutions, which also include the Natural History Museum and the Royal Colleges of Art and Music, was bought with the money raised at the exhibition. So, you can see, innovation and invention isn't something just for Prince Albert and the Victorians who visited the Crystal Palace. When we share what we know, we can inspire other people. And that goes for everyone, including you. Over the years and to this day, we have had many great minds here in Britain doing some truly spectacular work. And I'd very much like to introduce you to a few. I think that might be great. Oh, it looks like my ice cream steamer's running a little hot. I'll have to go for now. But do come back soon, won't you? Doodaloo for now. Sir Sidney McSprocket's Great British Minds. With support from the Royal Commission 1851. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash McSprocket. Right, let's crack on with this week's Science in the News. It turns out llamas could provide the key to coronavirus immunity. Scientists have used data from llamas in the UK that shows that they naturally made antibodies that boosted their immune system and were pretty much resistant to COVID-19. So now experts are seeing whether they can use that to help us get the cure to the virus. Also, the United Arab Emirates sent a satellite to Mars this week. The 1.3-ton probe called HOPE launched from a spaceport in Japan. It's travelling 500 million kilometres. It should get there in February next year, 2021. And when it's there, it will study Mars's weather and climate. And finally, staying in space, a star has been sent hurtling across the galaxy after undergoing a partial supernova. It's a powerful explosion that occurs towards the end of a star's life. Normally, it destroys the star. This blast was not strong enough to do that. Instead, it just sent it flying across the universe. At, listen to this. At 900,000 kilometers an hour. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening to us. You've heard a brand new podcast series in there as well. Um, uh, so Sydney McSprocket, you can catch up with the whole of that wherever you normally get your podcasts from. It's at funkidslive.com and on the free Fun Kids app. Uh, well, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, by the way, please do leave a review for the show in there. Stick in your science question that you want answered. It's the only way I'll see it. You can get all of our brilliant Fun Kids series on Apple too. Uh, also, Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all over the country on your DAB digital radio, on that free Fun Kids app, and at funkidslive.com. 